You're listening to an Anderson Entertainment production. This episode, we have an exclusive preview of the new Space 1999 audios. There's a plant causing problems in the randomizer. And we enter the infinite monkey cage with Brian Cox and Robin Ince. That's all coming up in part 111 of the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. I think there's something quite pleasing about having the three numerals of this pod all the same. I agree, and it won't be repeated for another 111 pods, weirdly. (laughs) Is that the only point that's going to happen? We're at the halfway point to pod 222 then. Yeah, amazing. That's something to celebrate. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we need every little thing to celebrate we can get now. Uh, That's true. Yeah. So there's that. Now, you are Richard James. That's true. And you're still Jamie Anderson, son of the legendary television producer, Jerry Anderson, uh, creator of series such as Thunderbirds, Captain Scarlet, Fireball XL5, Terror Hawks, Dick Spanner and Space Precinct. Yeah. And that actually suddenly makes sense as to why we're doing this, the Jerry Anderson podcast, which is all about Jerry Anderson and those shows. And um, we glue all the things about those shows together with you and I talking nonsense, Richard. Isn't that right? You're right, it suddenly all fits together, doesn't it? For example, in this podcast we have coming up for your aural pleasure. Mm. Uh, we've got uh, Chris Day a little later on, of course, with a randomizer, which is really why everyone's here. We've got some news from the Jerry Anderson universe because there's always stuff going on. We also have some emails from our podsterons. They've been sending them in by the drove to podcast.jerryanderson.co.uk. They've been hashtagging us on Twitter, hashtag Jerry Anderson Podcast, tagging him, I'm Jamie Anderson, me, Richard N. James, mm. and him over there, Chris Dalek. And they've also been uh, jotting down their thoughts on our Facebook group. That's facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash podstrons, and I shall be reading them all out a bit later on. And finally, we've got Fab Facts coming up in just a little while. And of course, the first part of a new interview, Jamie. Oh, yes. Yes. Hey. The interview hey. with... Professor Brian Cox and yep. Sir Robin of Ince. Yes. I mean, the, now, does that mean I can do my um, Brian Cox impression? Uh, oh, <laughs> sounds a bit dangerous, but yeah, go yeah. on then. No, wait. Billions and billions of stars just shining down upon us, and they've been there for billions of years. How's that? No, that's pretty good. I, I thought yeah. for a second we played a bit of the interview out. Uh, <laughs> but no, he, he did not say that. But today marks the first of the three parts of our interview with Brian Cox and Robin Ince, uh, mm-hmm. covering lots of Space 1999 stuff, a fair bit of Thunderbird, a tiny bit of Captain Scarlet, a bit of Stingray. Well, all the usual stuff you'd expect, I suppose, from the Jerry Anderson podcast. So Great. I'm very excited about that. And I'm very grateful to them both for finding the time to have a chat with me. Uh, Now, I'm guessing that they are both, particularly Brian Cox, is of an age with me, isn't he? We're probably of a similar age, I would think. So his memories are probably my memories, aren't they? He doesn't go way back to the supermarination stuff, probably. No, no, he's mostly Space 1999, Mm -hmm. although he has no particular memory of his sister vomiting on his eagle in a bucket. So, really? Yeah. How strange. That must be just me, then. I think that might be unique to you. Yeah, that's odd, isn't it? Yeah. So anyway, there we go. We'll hear from them in a little bit. To help us on our way there, though, shall we uh, go for a fab fact? Oh, yeah, let's do that. Here we go. Now, time for this week's fab facts. So, this is fab facts. I've got a book of fab facts. I'm going to flick your shout fab. We stop and I read a fab fact and it'll be fab. It will. That's true. How is that for an intro? Yeah, that's it. You've got it. You've nailed it. Okay, fine. That's uh, cut print. We'll just uh, repeat that now and I won't have to say it ever again. Yeah. Here is the Book of Fab Facts, Richard. I'm Mm -hmm. starting to flick now. Are you ready? I am. Fab! Uh, uh, Ooh. Hmm? Oh, oh, actually. Oh, Oh, no. What now? (sighs) Uh Uh-oh. 
You've landed us in uh, 1968. Right. My favourite year, a fine vintage for everything mm. Jerry Anderson. Yeah. Except? Oh, well, yeah, Joe 90. So, <laughs> uh, we regularly mention how models from certain shows turn up later on, being cannibalised or being yes. blown up or turned upside down or uh, uh, not inside out. But yeah, always reused to uh, <laughs> to make the most of the props and models that they had in storage. Yes. So obviously we've got one more of those. But in this case, slightly more gruesome, as this has to do with the dismemberment of an iconic Anderson character. Oh, please. Really? Yeah. Sounds like one of my books. <laughs> it does, actually. This may end up being <laughs> the plot of a future Bone of the Yard book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in the Joe 90 episode... Colonel McLean. I'm not familiar with it because uh, I tend not to watch Joe 90. Anyway, right, that yeah. uh, episode opens with a shot of an excavating machine leaving a cave and crawling out onto a construction site. On that site, Richard, yeah, on the centre right of the shot, yeah, is the model of the jet air transporter that Virgil Tracy used to save Alan and Grandma in Moving Your Dead. Right. Iconic Thunderbirds episode. Indeed. Uh, not the uh, full-size puppet version, we should add, but yeah. the little tiny one that's seen rolling out Thunderbird 2's pod, which also features a little tiny model Virgil standing on the front of it. Ah. Oh. It's that model that turns up in Joe 90. Now, VHS and DVD, obviously standard definition and not very good transfers necessarily, it's not immediately obvious what that bit of the construction site is, but now we have the lovely Blu-rays thanks to Network... We can yeah, finally yes. see it much more clearly. Mm -hmm. So we can see that in Colonel McLean, it still carries the international rescue name round its base, so they didn't cover that up. Right. It's the same colours, and still attached to the front of the vehicle, in a rather sinister fashion, are the stumps of Virgil Tracy's legs. Uh, oh, come on. <laughs> really? Yes. At what? So evidently that someone's just grabbed this from the prop store, Stuck it on the construction site, possibly even with Virgil still attached, and then they may have gone, oh, uh, oh yeah, that's probably going to be a bit obviously Virgil, uh, just uh, let me... Um, <laughs> oh, no. And they've oh, snapped snap. him off and left the feet stuck to it. <laughs> obviously thinking, well, it's going to be so small, nobody's ever going to notice. They didn't expect Network to be doing Blu-rays, because Blu-rays yeah. didn't exist. They no. didn't expect us to be spotting it, and they certainly didn't expect us to be noticing poor Virgil's stumps left at the front there. But wow. you can see the familiar <laughs> yellow of his international <laughs> rescue boots. So, uh, oh, now, yeah, that's Chris Dale has provided us with some stills, which will be available to see in the uh, Jerry Anderson podcast Facebook listeners group on Facebook. Okay. Where they find that, Richard? Yeah. Well, it's uh, simply go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash podsterons. That's the place to go where you'll see it. So, um, yeah, poor Virgil. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's really gruesome, isn't it? <laughs> but, you know, as we've said before, these amazing bits of reused propery and model stuff yeah. turn up all the time. And why not? And they never, oh, they never expected us to be talking about this on a podcast. You can imagine them yeah. thinking, yeah, people might notice that. That'd be funny. No, they just thought, I'll just reuse it. Yeah, in fact, I suspect had they thought that or known that, they would have been absolutely paralysed with fear and never got anything made. <laughs> yeah. If they realised just how closely we'd be looking 50 years later. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Probably best they didn't know that. But, you know, yeah. uh, again, amazing attention to detail. They could have easily just, you know, put something much more simple in there or, or not even bothered. Yes, of course. But the fact that they mm -hmm. went and hunted for these things and put them all together is just a testament to the uh, attention to detail that the teams of Century 21 went to back in the day. Yeah, lovely. Nice. Right, there you go. I suppose that's the end of this one, isn't it? Oh, I suppose it must be. Yeah, it's the end of this week's... Stump, stump Fact! fact. <laughs> now, I can't imagine we'd get many more Stump Facts as we go on. You never but, know. Uh, there we are. Well, that's true enough. Now, interestingly, Warrior Girl 279 over on Twitter has hashtagged us Jerry Anderson Podcast and said, thank you for another great podcast. Uh, I'm looking forward to the day when Richard shouts fab and lands not only on a page about Space Precinct, but a fab fact about himself. Yeah. Could happen. Should it really happen. could happen. Must yeah. happen. And also... I've just had a thought, Jamie. So we've yes. been talking and uh, joking a little bit about your dislike, disdain, loathing for Joe 90. So listen, I'm going to open the floodgates. We all know the shows that we love, don't we? Because we talk uh -oh. about them all the time. But I want to know, 
from Jerry Anderson Podcast listeners. What is the series that you just cannot watch? You cannot <laughs> abide. You loathe. Okay? Let's let it all out. Don't be rude. Just tell us the name of the series and maybe a few words about why. Why don't you like it? Why, out of all of those fantastic series, does this particular one not float your boat? Yeah, now you know we're going to get a few people who email in and say, yeah, I'm not a massive fan of the Joey Hansen podcast, to be honest. I find it a really difficult <laughs> listen. <laughs> what do you mean a few more? Because we do get those every week, of course. Uh, yeah, I just choose true. not to read them out. The, yeah, in the hate right. mail bag. <laughs> yeah, so do let us know what's the worst Jerry Anderson series. Send it into podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk and, uh, well, we'll have something of a poll next week and I'll, uh, I'll read out your, your answers. Uh, talking of emails, we have had a few in already for this week. Would you like to hear some, Jamie? Nothing would please me more. I thought so. Do you remember last week I set a bit of a challenge because Sebastian Bird uh, shared with us his fantastic scene from uh, the Space Precinct episode Deadline with him doing impressions of Podley and uh, Brogan and Haldane. And I asked people to send in their very own impressions. And we've had a few. Would you like to hear them? Yes. <laughs> First one is from Stephen Watson, who says, Hi, boys. Here's one from Perils of Penelope. Watch out, Richard. Best wishes, Stephen. Well... I shall be retiring for the night now, Parker. Very good, my lady. I trust you have everything you require? Well, I must admit, I miss my usual cup of cocoa. I did anticipate that, my lady, so I slipped it up flask of your favourite bread in the foot of your egg box. Thank you, Parker. Good night, then. Good night, my lady. Isn't that nice? A bit of Parker and a bit of uh, Lady P. Lovely. Well, but very versatile, I'd say. I rather like it because uh, you can hear the warmth in, in Penelope's voice. Thank you, Parker. That love that she seemed to have for Parker is very nice. Uh, we have one here, of course, from Simpsons Clips 24, who says, Hello, Richard and Jamie. Simpsons Clips 24 here. I was listening to that audio file by Sebastian Bird last week, and when you said to send in your own impressions, that got me thinking, and I thought I'd share with you my impressions of some characters from Lavender Castle. All right, Aegon, where's Walking Stick? Oh, I won't tell you that until I'm back in my mammoth machine. Have you no humanity at all? I'm glad to say, Captain, that I don't suffer from that weakness. <sighs> let him go, Roger. We can't let Walking Stick die. <laughs> The eclipse. <laughs> it really is Lavender Castle. What? What do I see? I see! Walking Stick! Walking Stick! I'm on my way! Oh. There. Now then. Have some of this. That's going to save my life. It already has. It reflected the sun. That's how we found you. Great. Isn't it lovely that Lavender Castle does get some attention despite being one of the lesser known Anderson shows? Absolutely. Simpsons Clips 24, they're a massive fan of Lavender Castle, we know, so well done to you. And finally, this one here is, uh, I think, my favourite, from Simon Allen. He says, here is my impression of Marina from Stingray. I think it sounds just like her. Have a listen to this. Great. There. Wow! Well, what, what, I mean, that, that is uncanny. It's that like she was in the room. So good, <laughs> isn't I, it? Yeah, you know when something yeah. shocks you so much, you you laugh. I, know. I mean, that's I, what I mean, happened there. I, I don't actually know how he did it. The that accuracy, very clever, isn't it? The accuracy was uncanny. I feel like he may have gone to some extreme lengths, like possibly dressing up as Marina and, may, yeah. and maybe even living oh. underwater for a couple of months to, uh, to almost, really get almost the, certainly. Yeah, Simon, impressive work, great, yeah. great research, uh, all yeah. the sort of finesse stuff there. Amazing, thank you so Lovely. much. Lovely, yeah. So uh, <laughs> do keep them coming in. Let's not stop there. If you've got any impressions of your favourite Jerry Anderson character, pop them in an audio file and send them into podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk, and uh, we'll play it out next week. Uh, amazing. What a yes, talented quite. lot our posterons are. Aren't they? Yeah. Would you like some Jerry Anderson news, though, Richard? Oh, is there some Jerry Anderson news, of Jamie? Of course there's some Jerry Anderson news, Richard, and here it is.
Go on. News, 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 news. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, we've got an exclusive for you, Podstrons. Ah. Last week, just after the podcast was recorded, in fact, so we couldn't tell you last week, Big Finish confirmed Space 1999 Audio Series Volume 1, the follow up to Breakaway, the hugely successful and critically acclaimed Breakaway. Yeah, yeah. Is going to be out in February 2021, obviously delayed because of COVID, as many oh. things have been, but such is life. Mm-hmm. I asked very nicely, and I was able to secure this short but sweet exclusive clip. <gasps> oh. Yeah. So. Oh. Here it is, the first time you'll hear anything from the Space 1999 audio series to be released next year. Enjoy. Would you look at that? Are we about to have humankind's first contact with aliens? We're not the first. What do you mean? Well, not quite, John. That's enough, Kenny. What are you two talking about? We may be the last of humanity, Simmons. What's the point in secrets? I insist. Carter, are you receiving? Loud and clear, Commander. I need an eagle launched immediately. Mm. Oh, exciting. Thank you, Big Finish, and Nicholas Briggs and Ian Meadows for putting that together for us, Uh, even though obviously it's not going to be released for, well, quite a few months yet. But uh, if you want to pre-order it from Big Finish, you can do so. There will be a special edition from the Jerry Anson store, a limited edition of 500 units with a special slipcase and special insert which will be available for pre-order later in the year. So um, okay. if you want to wait Might for that... Might want to hold fire for that. Then you yeah. should do, yeah. Now, stay... No, Jamie, oh, but, 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 yeah. I mean, what? that's not enough. Can you tell us anything else? Uh, how many stories? Are they new stories? Are they retelling of old oh. stories? What's the deal? Oh, yeah, I probably should have told you that, I suppose. Yeah. Um, hang on, hang on. Let me go onto the uh, the Big Finish website. Oh, that's a good idea, yes. And, that's uh, bigfinish.com. It is. I just don't want to tell you things that, you know, are, are inaccurate. So... Mm. Uh, so there are three stories. Uh huh. One is an adaptation of an original episode, Death's Other okay. Dominion. Ah. Oh, which okay. I believe you and I are doing a watch along of uh, yes. for Anson Insiders in a couple of weeks' time. That'll be fun. And then there's two other stories, both by Andrew Smith, hmm. The Siren Call, and Goldilocks. And I believe the one we just listened to was, uh, was from The Siren Call. So. Okay. There you go. Lovely. Now, I, uh, I know of some of the elements of the reworking of Death's Other Dominion because uh, I have been acting as, um, I think they're calling me executive story editor or something like that. Uh, right. <laughs> or okay. executive story consultant. I can't remember what the term is. Anyway, mm-hmm. but there's some lovely stuff being done to Death's Other Dominion in particular, so um, fans can look forward to that. Of course, the original one with um, with Brian Blessed. Yes. You haven't got him back, have it's you? It's Dr. Roland. No, no, no Brian oh. Blessed in this one. Oh, it's um, a shame. Because that was in the days before he was a very shouty man. Um, <laughs> it's true. He was actually once quite a subtle actor. I know. It's odd, isn't it? And it always bugs me. People always say the whole, Gordon's alive! But if you actually watch Flash Gordon, he doesn't say it like that. I believe... He doesn't shout it. ...that our interviewees later may uh, refer to that exact uh, thing. Well, so there we are. You're, well, all, let's just say no you're all in agreement with each other. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, there we go. So, uh, yes, just to read from the Big Finish website, in case you don't want to go there. The moon has been sucked through a wormhole in space and has arrived countless miles away from its proper place. I mean, it should be millions of miles, really. Um, well, yeah. The crew of Moonbase Alpha can only guess at the resultant devastation left behind on Earth. They must decide how best they can survive. Some Alphans find it difficult to let go of the notion of returning to Earth. Others are facing the reality that they must find another home to ensure the survival of the human race. They can't survive on Alpha indefinitely. Uh Dead ahead of them is a planet they call Meta, the planet that apparently transmitted a signal which caused their predicament. But as their moon drifts ever onward through space, there are other planets offering hope. So there you go. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting, isn't it? Yeah, it's really good, yeah. So they'll be doing a lovely job. Now, if you want to learn a bit more about that, then Big Finish are doing a virtual Big Finish Day on the 1st of August, which I believe is a Saturday. Is it? Yes. So from 4pm UK time, there's many, many hours of Big Finish stuff. Q&As with cast and crew and various ones. Now, I'm doing one of the sessions... Are you? What, tidying up after them, are you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm doing the biscuits, yeah. Uh, yeah, as, <laughs> yeah, we often, as you and I often do on these things, Richard. <laughs> yeah, that's true, yes. So I'm doing one, but it's actually not a Jerry Anderson one. So you'll have right. to wait and see for that. But I do, I'll 
forewarn you, I do crack out uh, one of my favourite impressions that I do, Richard, which I think I, I did for you last week, didn't I, secretly? Do you remember? Yes, you did. Yes, I, I do. How good is it? How good is it? What, on a scale of one to ten? Yeah. Seven. Wow, a seven. I thought you were going to go for a four ah. or a five. I'd be happy no, with no, that. No, it's pretty good. No, anyway, no, it's very good. So th- there is that. So I will be part of that. But there is another session, I believe, which is the Space 1999 session. So you'll find out a bit more there. So mm-hmm. uh, just pop along to the Big Finish YouTube channel. Uh, all links on bigfinish.com. And uh, make sure you enjoy a Saturday afternoon at virtual Big Finish Day. Yeah, that sounds great. There you go. Nice. The Thunderbird soundtrack, Richard, which we've mentioned a couple of times in the last couple yeah. of podcasts, the vinyl version mm-hmm. is down to its last 10 or 20 copies. So right. go and grab that. I'm not going to mention it again because everyone's bored of it now. But I've seen lots of people very happy with it. They love the packaging. Obviously, they love the sound. And yeah, just great music. Super iconic. Lovely Barry Gray. And a beautiful presentation by Silver Screen. So grab them before they're gone. But uh, that's the last thing I'll say on it. Okay. And uh, the UFO 50th anniversary post, which we've mentioned before, will be on pre order from next week. So uh, nice. you can go and get one of those. It's limited to 500 units worldwide. So a bit like the vinyl, that'll probably sell out fairly quickly too. Mm-hmm. Keep an eye. Just, uh, you know, pop along to the uh, the Jerry Anson store, shop.jerryanson.co.uk, search UFO poster, and you'll be magic over to the product page where you can grab it. I think that's it though, Richard, unless you've got anything you'd like to add to this news section no i'm afraid i don't jamie how disappointing okay sorry that's the end that was the news disappointing news i mean (laughs) no i should just clarify it wasn't all disappointing (laughs) in fact most of it was very exciting it was all exciting yeah i just thought i'd leave you (laughs) hanging there without saying that was the end of this week's did Did it confuse you it really took me by surprise yeah sorry about that (laughs) i didn't know what to do Uh, anyway (laughs) Now, we've had some more emails in. Jamie, do you remember last week we asked, or you specifically, I think, asked if anyone had ever named a child or if they themselves were named after Jerry Anderson characters? Oh, I did say that, didn't I? Yes. Yeah. Well, we've had a few uh, replies to that. Chris, uh, now, I think it's Chris Yost, but listen. Chris, you need to explain. So drop me another email at podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk because you very helpfully at the end of your email say from Chris Yost and then in brackets you put long O in Yost. But is that it? Oost? Is that like you? Yeast. Yeah. Yost. Uh, uh, so what I'd like you to do, Chris, is drop me a, an email with a word that rhymes with your surname and then I'll know next time. But anyway, Chris says, well, I'm not sure if this qualifies, but I had such a major crush on Maya from Space 1999 when I was a teenager. And the show was uh, new that when I married and eventually had a daughter, she was immediately named Oh, there we are. It does qualify. Yes. He says he's listening on Spotify and loving it. Hello, Jamie and Richard, oh, says hang on, Louise. Richard. Oh, yes. Sorry, I've just thought of a problem, though. If he sends what? a rhyming word, Chris, do not send the word S-C-O-N-E to illustrate the how the O is said, because <laughs> that could just open up even more problems. Yeah, because obviously it's scone, isn't it? Scone. Right, uh, on to the next one. Hey. What? Uh, Louise Potter says, Hello, Jamie and Richard. In the last podcast, you asked people, uh, do they have anyone named after Anderson characters? Well, I have. I've got two beautiful cats that my good friend Emma Nichols named when they were kittens. The boy is called Oink and the girl is called Marina. Oink because he had the same colour fur and Marina because uh, when she meowed, nothing came out. Oh, very sweet, isn't it? I know. Isn't that lovely? And Ian Thompson, good morning, gentlemen. Re your request last week for Anderson names. I have a son named Christopher, as he's referred to by his sister, mother and myself but to his fiance and the rest of the world he is known as Chris. So when either of you make a reference to the very talented Chris Thompson understandably my mind focuses on my son for a second sorry it's a bit of an obvious connection but it always makes me smile even if it's not my son you're talking about. There's also a double connection to this as well because there's also another Chris Thompson ex Manfred Mann's Earth Band singer and also he features on a solo song of Jeff Wayne's original album version of War of the Worlds there you go two for the price of one as ever thanks for all the efforts you go to to entertain us each week all the best from Ian Thompson and his son Chris gosh well there's also Chris Walker Thompson the uh, Patrick Troughton yes. uh, voice uh, impressionist um, uh, mimic and voice yeah. artist and also Chris Thompson uh, who is the uh, one of the editors at Titan Comics, I think. I mean, it just goes on and on, doesn't it? And uh, finally, Ashley Frost, you'll like this one, Jamie. After hearing your Blake 7 fab fact in, on YouTube uh, today, I thought I would email to share a name. My partner and I gave our son the name James Anderson. 
as a nod <laughs> to our best fanisms. James T. Kirk for my girlfriend and Jerry Anderson for me and my love of the Anderson universe. Kind regards, Ashley Frost. Nice. So I've got a <laughs> yeah. namesake out there. Yeah, sort of. Yeah. No, well, I'm I really James, wasn't. aren't I, technically? Yes, I know, but it's not actually named after Sh- you. Shut up, it? Richard. I'm it's just going to pretend it is, all right? All right. So if anyone out there has ever named their children Richard James, let me know. Podcast <laughs> at jerryanderson.co.uk. <laughs> <laughs> Surely that must have happened somewhere, please. You'd think so. They're quite common names, aren't they? Yeah. As muck, you might say. Anyway, <laughs> what was, yeah, have bye. you got any more in your mailbag? Not for now. No, we'll be coming back a little later on. I'll be reading out some tweets and some uh, Facebook posts and so on. Okay. Well, I think mm. we've kept people waiting long enough. Yes. Many people will be here solely to listen to the dulcet tones of not you and I, Richard. No, no. Or even Chris not. Dale. No. But instead, Professor... Brian Cox and Sir Robinins, uh, MBE, OBE, CBE, etc. Mm-hmm. I don't think he's got any of those actually, which is <laughs> ridiculous, obviously. Yeah, of course it is. So, uh, Professor Brian Cox, world renowned physicist, man, and presenter chap, mm-hmm. and Robin Ince, world renowned comedian, stand up, raconteur, etc. Yes. And they both host the Infinite Monkey Cage podcast, which, you know, some people may have heard of. I, I mean, yeah, it's a couple quite popular of our understand. listeners might have popped in there and, and been yeah. disappointed and come straight back to the Jerry Anson podcast, <laughs> which would be totally fair enough. But they, despite their ridiculously busy schedules and, uh, you know, against all the requests they must get, surprisingly, they agreed to do the Jerry Anson podcast, which is really lovely. Robin managed to rope Brian in and, uh, and arrange a time, which was very much appreciated so thank you Robin Uh, Mm -hmm. we had a lovely hour long chat about uh, all things Anderson so we're going to give it to you over three parts so here without further rambling from me good is our interview with Professor Brian (laughs) Cox and Robin Ince hello I'm Brian Cox and I'm Robin Ince and this is the Jerry Anson podcast oh how lovely that's made me very happy to do that so Jerry Anson podcast listeners probably I think have a high likelihood of also being listeners to the Infinite Monkey Cage so you all know our guests but just in case people don't know who you are gents could you just very briefly explain who you are and what you do outside of the Infinite Monkey Cage yeah I'm what do what? we do well you're you're meant to be a physics professor aren't you you're meant to teach people at Manchester but that all went uh, no I, I still teach creek, at the University it? of Manchester in the autumn so if you're listening to this and you're a uh, a potential undergraduate at the University of Manchester and you want to do physics, I will teach you quantum mechanics and special relativity in the autumn term this year, if you're coming, and next year, and for many years after that. So so my, if you want my full title, it's Professor of Particle Physics at the University of Manchester and Royal Society Professor for the Public Engagement in Science. Wow. And you could, if you're thinking of doing it and you think, I want to get a little bit ahead so I know what he's talking about, you might think you need to read the three volumes of Richard Feynman's introductory lectures on physics. But actually, just a couple of uh, novelizations of Space 1999 will show you where most of his scientific ideas about the nature of gravity and indeed what happens to the moon when it is forced out of orbit and travels to alien planets. A lot of that is what's covered in the introductory lectures, isn't it? So what you're supposed to do as a listener, if you don't know who Robin is, (laughs) is guess what his profession is, given that in introduction you may say early 1980s radio luxembourg or whatever <laughs> dj and radio luxembourg <laughs> and, and you'd be absolutely right that's broadly speaking what he is yeah that is what i no so what i do is i i was a stand-up comic i don't know where i am now i do kind of shows that are sometimes about science sometimes about art and i've, I've written a few books and the the last book was kind of about psychology and uh the nature of stand-up comedy and the nature of being human i managed to cover it all in 250 uh, pages everything's done if you want to know what it is to be human it's fine uh, readily available fantastic what a pair of intros thank you gents <laughs> and obviously you're both fully qualified as uh, jerry anderson fans to some degree although we're going to find out to what degree exactly there's no quiz don't worry i just you know well i, I can say that only one of us has an outfit actually has a uh, jerry anderson inspired outfit which i think copyright i think you're still allowed to freely wear that wherever is, you go it Brian. Is a, i it's have a, a martin landau black sleeve Space 1999, season one outfit. Although I always liked the season two, you know, the blue kind of uh, jackets with the, the, so I think they came in season two, didn't they? So I've also got one of those. Yeah. So I kind of, I'm a bit mixed up in, but that usually comes off anyway, because it's usually too hot. So it's mainly 
when I go to parties, I'm dressed as Martin Landau from season one. Which I think is appropriate. And I'm disappointed. And of course, a lot of people don't know the younger kids just think he's cutting a dash, that he is... Uh, <laughs> So it will slowly leak back into the fashion world. Those, those, uh, the beautiful looseness of the trouser around the, the ankle flares. will soon be seen in far the more refectories. And actually, yeah, you'll know this actually because um, when I uh, I spoke to someone about sort of making it because you can't buy them, right? So I had to have it made, and they they got these platform boots that they sprayed gold, and they said that from their perspective, he had gold boots. Is that true? Because I they always look white to me. But anyway, I ended up with golden mm, yeah, platforms. I thought, I thought they were white. Wow. An upgrade from the usual Commander yeah. Koenig uh, get-up, yeah, yeah. Brian. Lucky you. So Brian may have an outfit, but Robin, you, as we've already discovered in the pre-chat, you're the only one of the two of you that's seen the Secret Service. So on balance, <laughs> well, we'll find I'd out. I'd like the outfit. Okay. I would, the Secret Service is really... But I mean, it's such an interesting show because I was a huge fan of Stanley Unwin when I was a kid. I love, you know, whether it's you know, obviously, you know, later on you kind of find small faces and Ogden's not gone flake and stuff. But I have always loved Unwin Ease, but it's a, just such a strange because that is the last puppet show before Terror Hawks, isn't it? It is I indeed, think. yes. Yeah. It was the nail in the coffin for the Super Mario Nation era, that one. What I find the thing is with that one compared to everything else is that's the only one that has a sense, to me anyway, of having dated. I think there's something really fascinating. Before doing this, obviously, I went back and I watched some of the stuff that I hadn't watched for a while and, you know, watching some some of the early uh, episodes of Joe 90 and stuff like that because, obviously, as someone with glasses, that's something I, I've been both Elvis Costello <laughs> and Joe 90 since the age of nine years old when the prescription began. But what's great, and I think it happens with a few 60s shows. I think it's not merely the, the use of supermarination. I think the otherworldliness of both your dad's work and also of things like the Avengers, it doesn't age in the same way something like Sweeney might because it already is in this beautiful, slightly uncanny, slightly eerie and strange world. And it, that's what I, th- I think of all of the kids' shows you can return to. There are very few. Most of them, I would say to people, don't go back. Keep your memory intact because, you know, we sometimes, we're, oh, it's not as good as I, I thought it was. Well, of course it's not because you were eight. You have an entirely <laughs> different way of viewing the world and things change. But I actually find that I have no problem returning to Space 1999, to UFO, Joe 90, Stingray. Any, I mean, I suppose Stingray, you start to go, that does feel more like a kind of 50s or even a 1930s, 1940s Saturday morning adventure serial. But once you move into Thunderbirds and you move into Joe 19, you move into Captain Scarlet. I think that in Space brilliant. 1999, I think of all of them, I agree with you that when I came back to it, so I hadn't watched it for many years, actually. And when I came back to it, it was better than I remembered. So oh. what I remembered is, is growing up with it, you know, I was fascinated space, science fiction, anything at that time I, I would have watched. And so I loved the Eagles and I loved Moonbase. And I remembered it all, Alpha. But when I came back to it, the thing that stood out was the quality of the writing and the the kind of existential nature of the science fiction. It is closer to 2001 than it is to, you know, original series Star Trek or something like that. It, it's, you know, I mean, I mean, some of the, I was just looking through, actually. I thought, what am I... What are my favourite episodes? And most of them from season one. Although, interesting, I remembered season two more vividly because I remembered Maya, you know, and Tony Verdeschi. Uh, of course it would be Maya. Yeah, um, of course I remembered Catherine Shell. <laughs> but actually, on reflection, I went back to it, by the way, because I wanted to show my little boy, he's 11 now. So I thought, what can we watch together? And I, and I went back to it. And I thought season one was absolutely outstanding. You know, just in terms mm. of the quality of the writing. And, and I, I was just looking through. So I love Deaths of the Dominion, which um, is one of Robin's favourites because it's got one of Robin's favourite actors who is... Who is underplaying. underplaying. Let me say now that Brian Blessed, this is one of the most remarkable things. John Shrapnel, who's a quite brilliant actor, who died not that long ago, really wonderful. You would recognise me if you see him. You would definitely recognise his voice. He plays the kind of this fool character who is trying to hold up the mirror to reality. And Brian, Brian Blessed is just at this kind yes. of level. He's like, right, no, 
not Brian Blessed. It's before he became that. It's like that thing that when you, you watch him and when we've had him on the show and he does that, Gordon's alive. And of course, you actually watch him in Flash. He doesn't say like that in Flash Gordon. He just says, Gordon's alive, <laughs> which is a totally... And, and he's much more that level, whereas John Shrapnel is... It's a quite remarkable yeah. performance. And it has. I mean, that's the thing that I find really interesting about watching that generate One the amount of kind of existential anxiety that science fiction was exploring and the kind of the problems of what it is to be human it doesn't talk down to the audience in a way that i think other science fiction later science fiction yes. i i do kind of have a thing and brian and me might disagree on this but i i do ultimately find things like the star wars stuff i find that is still really it doesn't deal on the same level as a lot of the lower budget TV stuff did in terms of going, being human's really well, difficult. And we've just come out of the 60s and it's not been as good as we imagined. Of, I and, mean, it's the, as Robin will know, one, one of the things that I always come back to, particularly in our live shows, but also in the documentaries that I make, is this central question about what it means to be a, a fragile, finite human in a vast and potentially eternal and infinite universe, right? That, that is the only interesting question actually worth asking. <laughs> what does it mean to live a finite, fragile life in an infinite universe? And that's what Space 1999 is about, self-evidently, and it's not, it's not an accident, I suspect. I mean, I, I'd like to ask you actually what your memories are of it and how you view it, because I think it is that. It's a, a serious attempt to explore some serious philosophical questions, I think. So I, I was born 10 years after Series 1 aired, yeah, course, Brian, I so I'm, I can't give you any kind of uh, production feeling or stuff. But yeah, I mean, Dad was desperate to get away from all the kids stuff and make his transition to serious live action that would be taken seriously and ask big questions and give them a chance to have some real human drama, which you get with the, you know, the voice acting with the puppets, but they're so limited. And I think there was a big stepping stone to UFO to try and look outward at the universe and what might come in but it was still very earthbound and still a kind of action adventure group that was stuck on earth but yeah the, by sending them off into into space on that little satellite and disappearing away and being so isolated it gave them the chance to be to be much more grown up and do something very different and i think in terms of the storytelling across any anderson show yeah it is it's the most philosophically driven the most interesting and also the most disturbing when you send off Simmons in a box to starve to death because he wants to go home and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's well, there's some really and, dark stuff. Voyage's in Voyage's Return is a tremendous piece of writing, right? That idea that there's this uh, this guy. So the scientist, who play, Robin will know who plays the scientist. Is it the Quilla Drive? Is it called? Oh, what? Not no, you're not talking about Barry no, Morse. No. no, no. In Voyage's Return, where the, where the, no, where the space probe comes back and it, and it had destroyed civilizations essentially with its drive and the designer of oh, the drive yeah. i haven't watched that one for been, a very um, long time it was living a secret life essentially you know it, it was a tremendously deep piece of writing that this old man who'd been responsible accidentally for the deaths of potentially billions of people in civilizations across the galaxy ended up sacrificing himself to save the moon base i mean that's a that's a deep piece of writing i think yeah jeremy kemp was it playing yeah. queller was oh, it? Jeremy yeah. Kemp's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, Robin will now yeah. tell you what other yeah. Pinewood productions he's oh, been in. Je Jeremy Kemp, basically, you know when you see James Cossins and you confuse it with Jeremy Kemp, that's a typical thing. You know James Cossins, don't you? You always say You this, must know yeah. James. Oh, okay. I don't know anything. Ah, this is, <laughs> uh, you will know James. James Cossins is the uh, first on-screen victim of the cannibal in the film Death Line. <laughs> where the cannibals' only words are, mind the doors, but we'll deal with yeah. that on another day. But I was just thinking about <laughs> that, you know, that idea of drifting, you're never going to be home again. You're never going mm. home again. And there's a great, I'm trying to remember where, it's, it's a Scandinavian film, but I'm not sure whether it's Sweden or, or, or Norway. I don't know if either of you have seen it. I'll mispronounce it. Aniara or Aniara. And it's a film where it's basically about a liner that takes people between uh, Earth and Mars, the new colony on Mars. And very early on in the journey, there's a comet strike, or in fact, smaller than a comet. There's basically a strike, which means they lose all power. And the rest of the film is about this liner, this kind of luxury liner, just drifting in space and seeing as people slowly lose meaning 
I really recommend it. It's only about three or four years old, wow. it's, and it's a really kind of disturbing. But when I watched that, I only watched it a few months ago. I thought this has part of what Space Nineteen Ninety Nine is on. Apart from obviously Space Ninety Nine didn't have that weird orgy scene. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a very, uh, <laughs> it's a very uh, peculiar. But again, that the sense of being lost and all of that existential anxiety, which is even if you're on, uh, if you're on Spaceship Earth. As uh, you know, that lovely description of uh, of of it, as uh, Buckminster Fuller used to call it, and that I think that's what's great about Space Nineteen Ninety Nine as well. Is it it doesn't necessarily matter they're adrift from Earth. In some ways, that's Earth as well. We are yeah. in this enormous yeah, and finding meaning when everything around you seems to be. Dark. You think about the context of when and, it was made. I mean, it wasn't obviously it was quite close to two thousand and one. And I was reading about mm. 2001. See, I couldn't find my annual, but I have just picked this on. Here's my Jack Kirby Marvel <laughs> 2001 adaptation this is, of that. It's an audio podcast, uh, Robin. There's no point. It in doesn't matter. Holding... I'm holding up. I've, I've, they can hear it. Fear. Hear, hear yeah. the work of Jack Kirby. But we can feel it. Look on my works, you but mighty. What's interesting is if you read about what Kubrick was thinking when he was developing 2001 with um, Arthur C. Clarke, yeah, there's a. I remember reading it was called Journey Beyond the Stars, I think, initially as a project. And it was about humankind's limitless potential beyond the surface of the Earth. But also the fact, he was interested in the fact that once you once you go into the infinite and once you face it, then the psychological challenges and indeed the, the spiritual challenges, philosophical challenges that you face are, are unprecedented. And that's what that's what he, he wanted to make a film about, and I think he did. Most people will accept, but Space Nineteen Ninety Nine, particularly, I think, in the first season, is an extension on because there's more time of those thoughts and exploration of those ideas, and actually looks as you said, Robin. It actually looks good now. It's, it's, I can't think of anything else other than two thousand and one. I would say made at that time in the late 60s, early 70s, or mid-70s, that actually looks good. You know, the, the special effects stand up in the main, I think. Well, oh, yeah. I think that's so interesting because the special effects, thats I love that transition between the super marionation to the live action because, like Ed Bishop, for instance, in UFO, I like the fact that a lot of people are dressed as if they were puppets. There's kind of an interesting thing. If, if you look in the same How way that the, the, the movie version of Watchmen... <laughs> If you look at the, the makeup and the wig that Ed Bishop has, it's awesome. the only time he's ever been blonde on film, as far as I know. He has a look which is as if he's in the transitionary phase. As, uh, you know, it's mid Pinocchio. He's almost a real boy, but not quite yet. And Peter Cordino as well. You know, of course, he was best known as a pop star. I suppose then. I mean, that in fact, UFO. When we were talking about bleakness, I mean, the first episode is basically someone looking for their sister and finding out that all her organs have been harvested by an alien intelligence. <laughs> That that for well, Saturday tea time when you're having your mixed grill common. is quite a quite the time. <laughs> if you go back, that was a really common thing. <laughs> oh yeah, a good mi- mixed grill and alien uh, <laughs> harvesting. Yeah, and I think actually Space 1999 looks less like that, but that's one of the reasons those effects work so well is because that they are only a couple of steps from the incredible effects that you, we had already seen in things like Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet as well. Again, Captain Scarlet. I mean, all of these things, the bleakness, the death, yeah, that the forbidding was of, voices. You know, th- this is, it's a very interesting generational time. I think, you know, at the moment we're seeing a, a lot of kind of people of our age seem to have got some control over this whole kind of, you know, folk horror thing and a return to the haunted generation as we're known as. You know, the haunted generation who these other things like Children of the Stones as well, the Owl Service, uh, a lot of things dealing with with a darkness of folklore and stuff. The changes where everyone suddenly goes mad when they hear, they smash up. Do you remember the change? Changes. It was really dark, but basically what happens is people suddenly go, oh, I've got a terrible headache. I'm going to smash my telly in the oven, right? So what they do is after they've smashed everything up, they go, we've smashed all the stuff. We better try and get a ferry to France, right? That's roughly, I'm smash, giving you a price smash, here. Hang on a minute. Just and it's go back. The- smash your telly in the oven. Yeah, they smash all, like, anything with technology. There's a bit with someone oh. just smashing my toaster. It makes bread magical, no, oven, right? It's a really... In the oven? Oh, no, no, no. They smashed the telly oh, and, and the oven. I thought and, you said in. And the oven. <laughs> and the oven. Yeah, said in as well. The oven <laughs> to smash the, 
Yeah, and we're nearly ready for smashing the. Uh, I thought it was kind um, of a telly, tidy thing, you know. We're, we're going to smash it up and put it in the yeah. oven, and then smash it up with a hammer or something, and it'll contain all the bits. Because everybody was, I thought oh, it was that no, kind of I sensible. Mean, you say could have saved time doing that. thing to not mess the house up <laughs> at the same time as. Place Fanny Craddock in our oven. <laughs> but yeah, the, all of those things are that they have this connection to a real anxiety about meaning. Because the changes, it turns out, spoiler alert if you've not seen it, but it has been available now for 47 years. But it basically turns out that it is a, a kind of, it's not the green man, but it's someone within a mountain. It is the spirit of nature basically saying, you've been very bad and uh, I'm glad you smashed up all the stuff. Don't know why you put the uh, tellies in the oven. <laughs> that took too long. Yeah. Amazing. We we will return to Space 1999 and other unrelated movies in due course. I think out of all the billions and billions of podcasts I've been on... No, that just, that says, that's not Brian Cox, is it? That went a bit kind of... Uh, Sinister. Yeah, it's very odd, wasn't it? Clarice. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, that wasn't that amazing. How lovely to have Brian Cox and Robin Ince on the Jerry Anderson podcast. Yes, an absolute honour, and they were lovely and... Um, just to forewarn you, Brian Cox does turn the air slightly blue at the end of part three, but I'm sure we'll beep it out. <laughs> yeah, OK. Um, he got quite passionate about something. So, Did he? Uh, yeah, yeah, so you can look forward to that. But uh, yeah. lots more. Anderson, Space 1999, Thunderbirds, sci-fi and other general chit-chat coming over the next two weeks with parts two and three of our chat with Brian and Robin. And thank you again to both of you for uh, coming on the podcast. Lovely. You're listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Don't forget you can subscribe to us on whichever platform you're listening to us on. Just hit the like, follow or subscribe button and that way you'll be notified every time a new episode drops. And of course, we'd love it if you could leave us a few words in the form of a rebating uh, <laughs> and share us with your friends so they get to hear us too. Now, over on Twitter... People have been hashtagging us Jerry Anderson Podcast. They've been tagging me, Richard N. James, him, I'm Jamie Addison, and him behind over there, skulking by the pot plant, Chris Dalek. Ride Theory, for example, says, I'm really looking forward to the upcoming Jerry Addison Podcast interview with Robert Ince and Brian Cox, the infinite Mitch the Monkey Cage. Ooh, Yay! I should have said that. Damn I it. know. Yeah, I like it. Aaron Rook says, Hi, my name is Aaron. I love listening to the podcast. I've started reading Gemini Force 1 and was wondering what the ships look like and if we'll ever get merch based around them. Keep up the good work, counting the days till we get Firestorm. Ah, so what do you think of that, Jamie? Uh, so if you heard on um, our previous podcast with MG Harris, we've got Andrew Probert in. Andrew previously designed the Cylons for Battlestar Galactica, original series. Yeah. The Enterprise D. Nice. For, uh, <coughs> Lovely. For, for something called Star Trek. Oh, yeah. Uh, is it Star Trek? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's that one. Rings a bell. The helicopter for Airwolf and, uh, and much more beyond. Um, very talented man, very well respected and dived in to do some design work for us. So yes, um, GF1, the base, and GF2 uh, have official designs, which, um, well, actually GF2 features on the covers of the soon-to-be-released new paperback versions of Gemini Force 1. So oh, lovely. You, you'll see it there. We might do a bit more GF1 merch. Yes, so stand by for yeah. potential stuff there. And is there anywhere else we can see those designs or not? Is there a... Oh, just page. search Gemini yeah. Force One. I right. think maybe yeah. GeniForce1.com, actually. There may be a website okay. still there, possibly. I Great. can't remember. <laughs> but they'll, they'll be around. Just get, just go on Google. Yeah. Following on from his impressions last week, Seb Bird got in touch again today to say, uh, thank you for my minute of fame. I think your job is quite safe, Richard. Although, if there's anything coming up in the future, I do a very good technician number six. <laughs> right. <laughs> we'll bear that in mind. Over on our Facebook group, uh, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash podstrons, April Penfold posted a couple of things. Firstly, she was on the motorway the other day, just finished listening to pod 110 with Hubby on the motorway, and we saw this Eddie Stobart lorry. Now, what do we know about Eddie Stobart lorries, Jamie? Um, mm -hmm. Well, they've, they've got Famously. names on. Yes. And this particular one was named Captain Scarlet. Nice. Who, yeah. who picks the Stobart lorry names? I think, isn't it the drivers? And I think traditionally, now interestingly, this was a, a double T, Scarlet double T. And I think traditionally the drivers, who were traditionally men, named them after their wives, I think. So ah. maybe one of them was, was, was Scarlet. 
oh, and lovely. a bit of a Jerry Anderson fan, yeah. And then she went on to say in another post, to complete my Anderson day, I'm sat with hubby watching Joe 90 for the first time. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh. So uh, the scene of Joe's dad, uncle and win agent arguing is depicted in a sequence of still images. Mm. It's the first time I've come across this in the Anderson world and wondered if there was any particular reason why they decided to do this. And a few people had a, a few ideas which they commented underneath. But Jamie, do you know why they did that? Was it a stylistic choice or uh, perhaps because of um, economic concerns or timing? Well, do you think? so it's a fascinating story as to why mm. they've done that. But actually, I don't know the story myself so uh, no no, no I, d- I have no idea I mean I, just right. experimenting with different styles I'm sure it must have been done on a show yeah. in the 60s and somebody saw it and thought oh that would be cool but it does stick I, out like a sore thumb a bit doesn't it that yeah, sequence yeah, yeah. I don't I don't know uh, if, if somebody knows the actual answer mm-hmm. I'm looking at yeah. you Chris Dale over yeah. there by the pot plant <laughs> yeah. then please let us know yeah uh, Hugh Morn says, since Anderson-related dreams were briefly touched on in the latest episode, I'm curious to know what Anderson-themed dreams, if any, our podcast hosts have had over the past few months while lockdown has been implemented. I've not had any since lockdown. I did for a while and still occasionally have it. A kind of recurring dream of there being a second series of Space Precinct. How sad <laughs> is that? And, and generally, the dream involves me turning up and realising that they're all filming it without me. Oh, that's <laughs> sad, isn't yeah. it? So that's obviously a bit of an actor's anxiety dream there. Yeah, that is. Well, un- understandable. We yes. all have uh, anxiety dreams of sorts about these things. I don't think I've had any Anderson-specific ones, but it's very difficult. Like, as you might imagine, my day starts and ends in the world of yeah. Anderson. That's right. So I sort of almost wouldn't notice it if there was a dream. But equally, my subconscious mind is probably going, oh, anything but that when I'm asleep. <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, that's right. I suppose um, so. No, I'm not, I do sometimes have dreams about meetings or seeing people right. or uh, they're really <laughs> boring things. But uh, no, yeah, nothing. Yeah. I haven't been adventuring in Stingray or Flying an Eagle or, uh, no, or working shame. for Shadow or anything like that. Sorry to yeah. disappoint. Okay, and finally, uh, we're hearing from Simon Allen again, who says, Returning to the rather grim fact about the highest number of deaths in an Anderson production, well, surely that must be Space 1999 Breakaway. We saw the space dock destroyed, plus the Metaprobe, plus lots of people on Earth might have perished as he got used to new tide patterns, etc. I think we're going to leave that thread there. I don't. I think we've had enough of, uh, of death and destruction in, in the, the Anderson m- universe. morbidity yeah. stakes, yes, I think. Yes, that's right. That's it. But Done. I think Case probably closed. right there. Case closed. Yeah, Thank you, quite right. So there we are. Yeah, do get in touch. Uh, podcast at Jerry Anderson uk. tweet us facebook us and we'll see your messages and read them out next time i look forward to you reading them out yeah to round off pod one 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 of the jerry anderson podcast mm-hmm. i think we should hand over to chris dale who's been standing there very patiently by that i know i'm all sorry chris all the time yeah he has so yeah should we just let him get started with his legendary randomizer yeah go on then chris good luck christopher Report! Humanoid prisoners have been captured and their machine has been secured. Excellent! Steady on. Oh, no, don't push her. Ow. Oh, really? With the time destructor under our command, conquest is assured. What? Time destructor? No, 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 no. Randomizer. But we have detected terranium from Uranus. Yes, well, I'd rather you kept that to yourselves, actually. But honestly, this isn't the time destructor, it's the randomizer. I suppose you could use it to kill time in a sense, but it's not even... Silence! Explain the function of this machine! Speak! Oh, yes, sorry. Well, inside this machine is every Jerry Anderson television episode and feature film ever made, and... Anderson, I have no understanding of the word... Oh, I'll tell him you said that, and I think he'll be very hurt. You will explain the operation of this device? Well, it's very simple. Uh, uh, If one of you gentlemen would like to place your little sucker arm on the big red button there... Do do you need a hand with that? I can do it! I can do it! Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Yes, that's it. Now the machine is having a little think, and in a moment it'll print out a piece of paper telling us which episode of which series I'll be watching this week. There will be no watching this week! You will be exterminated! Oh, what a pity. However, today you would have been watching an episode of Stingray. Oh, that would have been nice. And it would have been Plant of Doom. Marina... When I say run, run. Right, run! Alert! Alert! Prisoners escaping! Alert! Alert! Prisoners have escaped! Prisoners have escaped! Alert! We have failed! Still, plant of doom. It sounds a most powerful weapon. We must seek, locate, and cultivate it. Seek, 
So after a long absence on the randomizer by uh, Stingray, we are back with episode 2, Plant of Doom, which was apparently broadcast in the UK as episode 34 originally, which makes this... My slave Marina has escaped! Rather silly, because it's like, it's taken Titan 33 weeks to realise that uh, Marina has escaped in that order. We're also, uh, we're getting another... Look at, uh... Oh, great Teufel! Oh, fish god Teufel! To your face to Titan, leader of the underwater city of Titanica! Who only appeared in the... I think he, he disappeared after the Golden Sea in production order, so again, it doesn't make sense to bring him back. So late in the run. Even now, Marina is with the Akasid Terranians, Troy, Tempest, and his friends. Teufel was going to open his mouth, got a great big light coming out of it. You show me a blue coral flower, great Teufel. But how can that help me? It's starting to smolder, and I'm not clear if, um, in this episode, characters are actually aware that the, the plant is smoldering. That exotic perfume? I have never known it before. It is intoxicating. I know, you know, clearly they can smell it, but um, they all seem unable to see the great wisps of vapour coming off the... The flower! It is consuming the atmosphere! It must be! I must destroy it! Titan put, puts things together very quickly, um, considering what we see later on in the episode from other characters. But he's uh, smashed the plant. I'm not sure how knocking it off the table is enough to... Uh, to negate its effects, but there we go. The mighty sea god has shown me the way. No, I was just trying to kill you. Is the answer. I'm bored in this tank. He's only got like three square feet to move in. Anyway, back at Marineville, Marina is very sad. And we don't like to see Marina very sad, do we? Say, Marina's crying. Atlanta, she's really crying. What are we going to do? Well, what can we do, Troy? She can't speak to tell us why she's upset. Maybe she doesn't like Marineville. Or dry land, come to that. Say, maybe she's homesick. How about it, Marina? Are you thinking about home? This is more stuff that makes no sense being put so late in the run, but... Um, sure, we know it's on the bottom of the ocean, but exactly where? I get the, the impression that a lot of the, the earlier episodes were sort of thrown back later into the run. Um, kind of to to sort of bury certain bad episodes later in the run, and I don't think... Security ship has gone on a pleasure cruise? This really applies. Sure, it'll be a chance to meet Marina's people. We'll be exploring a new underwater city. Because as I remember it, this one's generally a good episode. Take care of HQ. Let's hope it satisfies Atlanta. Somehow, I have my doubts. Also, I gather there was quite a lot of material shot for this one that doesn't make it to screen. This I, I once saw the script and the opening... Um, the opening lines of um, of direction gives this sort of really long journey of the camera towards Titanica, you know, going up mountains and down trenches and until you finally see this glorious city. And in the episode, it's just like, boom, there's Titanica. Um, which is not to say that, you know, shot of Titanica isn't, isn't impressive enough in itself. It's just like they looked at this script with this sort of movie quality level of direction in it and said, no, cut all that, we don't need it. And while the Stingray crews search for where Marina thinks her home might be, someone else's home on the island of Lemoy. Uh, oh, I, I do love all this um, stuff in X20's house, the way everything flips round and, and flops over to reveal all his consoles and and such. Again, it's, it's stock footage almost every time, but it, it just looks so cool. Because it isn't immediately obvious that all that's there. X20 to Titan, come in, please. Titan to X20, what have you to report? The World Aquanaut Security Patrol vessel Stingray has been launched and is passing the island. I have learned that Stingray is bound for Pacifica in the domain of the traitorous Marina. And she herself is aboard. Also, another thing that um, doesn't make much sense, putting this 
so late in the original broadcast run is the characters changed quite a bit over the course of the run, and particularly Ray Barrett's voices for Commander Shaw and Titan. Um, they're not quite as we would recognise them yet. Um, Titan is much deeper than he would be in, in later episodes. And also, he and X20 have still got this... There's still a sort of credibility to their villainy at this point, whereas in later episodes they were... X20! They were played a bit more comedically. The underwater city of Marina's father, Aphony, and present him with this plant. When the cover is removed, its exotic perfume will consume the air, and Aphony and his guests from Stingray will die as they deserve. You will say you are from the underwater city of Kazuma. And Kazuma. have oh. Yeah, I, I also am not clear if this flower it's already approaching the that um, Titan's going to give to X20 to give to Marina, who will ultimately take it back to Marineville, is uh, the same one that tried to kill him earlier, or if they've got, like, multiple of these killer plants just hanging around Titanica. Um, clearly nobody knew that it could poison anyone until until Teufel worked his magic on it. But, um, there we go. X20 is off to uh, Pacifica, being escorted by one of these lovely little terrorfish. And I'm watching this in the, uh, the HD, HD version that was on the Super Mario Nation box set. And it's... Um, you know, the Terrafish model, which I've never really appreciated much over the years, has got so much detail on it. X20 to escort vessel. It must be Stingray. Uh oh. <laughs> I love the way that Aquafibian just looks at the other one. Oh no, we're dead. Uh, it, the interior set as well of the, the, the Terrafish is, is pretty nice as well. It sounds like one of those mechanical fish from Titanica, and there's another smaller craft with it. And this would also be the first appearance of uh, X20's ship. Stingray is approaching at speed. You must intercept Stingray at all costs. I will proceed to Aphony's domain. Terrafish is turning back while X20 goes on. And what I find interesting about this episode, and again, I, ha I hate to keep going back to the thing of it being put so late in the run originally, is um, for this episode and the very first episode, the Terrafish is presented as this really genuinely dangerous threat to Stingray. Here we go, they're just sneaking up on them. Without any warning at all, almost. Dive, Troy, dive! Yeah, they only just avoided getting hit there. And yet, in, you know, as time went on, the Terrorfish, the Aquafibians, became less of a threat to Stingray. Um, I mean, there's... I, I want to say in, in Man from the Navy they find a terrorfish and they, they destroy it off screen. It becomes, by the end of the series, the terrorfish is just like, you know, you can blow on it and it will explode. Here it's like, oh my goodness, this is really dangerous. We are seriously under attack and we've got to do everything we can to get away from these these really dangerous machines and the, the sort of cunning warriors who, who pilot them. And I I kind of appreciate that it couldn't stay as dramatic as this for the entire series. Oh, and there's that gorgeous shot of Stingray leaping out of the water. Which I understand they um, they only did one take off. They were prepared to do quite a few to get that looking absolutely perfect. And yet they got it right first time. Um, I could be wrong on that. But, um, well, there we go. I've been wrong before. Right. Stand by to repel attack. So, yeah, in, in the original broadcast run, it would make so little sense to put this so late on. When we've got to this point of the Terrorfish are just... You know, basically made of cardboard, and you can, you know, you can kick them and they'll fall apart. And now it's like suddenly, oh my goodness, this is really, this is really serious stuff. But this battle is just so, so well directed. Green zero five. The pacing, especially the music and the voice acting, is just so on point. And there goes the terrorfish. And when I was a kid, I had a friend who found the um, Ooh, a phones. the shot of the terrorfish, you know, being hit, but then. The, the wreck floating away with its jaw flapping up and down. He thought that was the funniest thing he'd ever seen. He would watch that moment over and over on a loop just to see the, the fish's um, jaw flapping. Anyway, we are now at Pacifica. Aphony, the peaceful one, 
cultural lord of the oceans, great leader of the famed city of Pacifica. And guy who has a lot of books on his shelf behind the throne there. Oh, so many books. I come in peace to give you news of your daughter. As is the custom in my part of the underwater world, I bring you a rare and fragrant flower. It is a symbol of peace and an omen of good fortune. I have heard that you have suffered much since the evil Titan seized your daughter. And going back as well to how uh, how much more credible X20 and, and Titan are in early episodes, I do like how. Uh, I will not intrude on this happy reunion. How X20 seems almost like. Is Aphne. Almost genuinely concerned for Aphne's, Aphne's feelings, and it's like he, he's playing his part so well at this point. And that's it, he's left the flower behind. Heading home. X20 reporting to Titan. All is well. Your instructions have been carried out. He's also got fantastic hair and eyebrows, X20. The, the hair almost looked like it's um almost looked like it's it's made of feathers. I guess this is it. It's a building. An underwater skyscraper. Jumping catfish, what a place! And again, it, it's so weird watching the first episode of Stingray, and they say you know, Phones is very sceptical of the idea of there being intelligent life underwater. And then suddenly, for 39 weeks after that, they can't stop finding cities and, and races that they never knew existed somehow before the series started. It's very strange. The water's being pumped out. Won't be long now, Marina, before we see your folks. You get the impression that they're in the airlock on the puppet stage where you can see all the, the bubbles and um, bits of seaweed and stuff floating past uh, the canopy window. It's, it's very impressive stuff. As is the set of, um, of Aphne's palace, really, this, this throne room. You don't get much of a sense of like a, a, a world, a city outside of this one room, but it's very impressive for what it is. Guess the old boy is her father, Phones. He sure is an impressive looking guy. Yeah, Troy, but what's with all this arm waving? Because they're talking to each other. Maybe by thought transference. Well, it could just be sort of sign language, I suppose, but... Oh, they're so happy to see each other. I love Marina's smiling face. I've got a feeling this is going to be quite a session. Oh, yeah. Lots of food on the table. There's fish and... Uh, sure is crustacean -y things and... Um, this meal, it's delicious. Miscellaneous. This place is a cultural underwater city. Just look <laughs> at those statues. You know, Troy would say that about McDonald's. Someone just throws a load of food in him and he's like, wow, cultural city. It's beautiful. And they got that plant. He's saying something about the plant. Oh, that's it. Cover's coming off. And surprisingly, it's not going to do its thing straight away. Gee, that perfume's out of this world. At least a little bit of perfume, but not enough to overpower anybody. And Marina puts the uh, cover back on. Does Marina come back with us, or will she stay here with her father? I don't know, Phones. I kind of hope she might decide to become a permanent member of our crew. Hey, I've got dibs on her. Leave her alone. We wish to thank you, on behalf of the World Aquanaut Security Patrol, for the hospitality and friendship extended to us. Naturally, Marina, I would like you to come back with us and maybe help in the fight against the enemies of your people. But if you prefer to stay... There are no hard feelings. Do you understand? Oh, she understands, but she's very sad. And again, one of the things I love about wants to come back with us, why she'll follow Marina as a character. And we got back. Come on, skip on. And particularly the way she's presented in this episode, in this scene with her father, is because she can't speak. Everything she is has to be conveyed through the puppeteering and the expression on the character's face. And I I know there are some people out there who don't like her, but I think she's one of the she's one of the great success stories in terms of characterization in the Super Mario Nation era because the the people operating her have so little to work with and yet they manage to to get so much out of you know out of shots like this where it's just this long slow pan towards her face and she just looks towards her father and she's got the tears on her face it's uh they really do so so much in so many small ways to make these characters and these worlds seem um seem so real anyway stingray's now heading home say phones do you hear something yeah 
Huh? Sounds like something banging on the hull. It is, Skipper. Look, it's Marina. I knew it. Phones, open the Somehow, door. Marina can yes, swim sir, faster than Stingray can move. Um, again, plot convenience. Maybe she's holding on to something with her foot. I don't know. She was holding the plant with one hand and waving with the other. But what about her father? Surely he could be in danger from Titan. How could she desert him? Maybe she figures she can best fight her father's enemy with us. Yeah, and maybe she's still working for Titan and come back to spy on us. And this is another thing I like in this episode, Atlanta's scepticism. Are you giving this to me, Marina? Everyone else is like, hey, she's a cool new friend. Isn't that a sweet thing to do? How about that, Atlanta? Isn't she just well, wonderful, Atlanta? I must admit it's a nice gesture. Thanks, Marina. Whereas in this situation in real life, you would be a bit suspicious. Here's a, you know, beware Greeks bearing gifts. Well, here's this um, mm. underwater lady with a nice plant. Atlanta's going to put it on top of her piano and have a little play. I was also never quite sure if Atlanta had her own home or if she lived with her father or if she sometimes alternated between the two because this doesn't look like the normal Shaw household. Anyway, enough of that. The plant has kicked in. I can't breathe. Somehow it knows that this is the perfect time to... Uh, I'm being hot in here. To, ...to kick in and... Uh, and then maybe it was the piano playing set it off. It didn't certainly didn't go off in um in Afony's palace. It's not like this. I can't figure this. Still no reply. Maybe she's not home. Maybe she doesn't want to see me. Oh, it couldn't be that. Everyone wants to see me. Atlanta! Oh, that's it. And here we go, the most dramatic scene of a puppet trying to break down a door. Possibly in television history. Two thumps. Yeah, this sequence isn't quite as dramatic as the um, the terrorfish attack earlier, but the music is trying to make you think it is. There we go, Troy's in. <coughs> There's no air in here. The air was consumed by that plant. There's no doubt about it. Well, it looks that way. How are you doing now, Atlanta? Yeah, but rather than rush the plant off to the lab to do some tests, they've just put the cover back on and left it on the table. It made me pretty bad to do this to me. Well, you sure could have fooled me. She looks so sweet. Now, wait a minute. We can't be certain... Yeah, there's, there speaks the voice of a man who's clearly fallen for a lot of um, a lot of wrong women over the years. I know you think I'm crazy, but I believe Marina's innocent. Fine words, Captain, but you'll have to prove it. I'll prove it, even if I have to risk her life to prove it. Oh, now, that's the kind of friend you want, really, isn't it? I believe in Marina. He's, he's so willing to stand by you that he'll throw you into mortal danger. Because he believes in you. Anyway, um, they've, I guess, brought Marina over to Atlanta's house now. I'm not quite sure how they explained this to her, but they've thrown her in with the, into an empty room and the plant just to see what she'll do. And she's more interested in the piano. And again, wonderful puppetry of just her reaction to this strange noise. And she's, she's takes a moment to think about it and then she she sits down to play again it's this is lovely character stuff a lovely way to give this this puppet a character that she just she doesn't have without a voice artist and yet she has got a character and it works really well meanwhile troy phones atlanta and her father are spying on marina now if marina knows the deadly effect of that plant she'll get out of there fast then we'll know for sure she's a spy. This is rather cold for the Stingray crew. Give her a few more minutes. We gotta be certain. It's like sort of borderline... Stop it! Stop it! Torture almost. She's going through. She must be innocent. She, she must. Not yet, Atlanta. There's still time for her to smash the plant. If she's guilty. And smashing the plant again. That, that smashing the plant wouldn't necessarily kill it. But, yeah, Marina's struggling. The room is full of smoke, and I'm still not sure if anyone can actually see that or not. She's collapsed. Okay, Troy, get rid of that plant. Too late, Commander. He's already gone. Oh, that's it. He couldn't wait to rescue Marina. Marina. Oh, gee, I'm sorry I ever doubted you, Marina. Please forgive me. I guess we all owe you an apology, Marina. Yeah. And again, what I like from the fallout of this episode is that... Now, let's have some dinner. 
You're all invited, and Marina is guest of honor. Marina looks so so hammered at this point. She looks thoroughly fed up with everybody. But I love going forward. That, and I think I've said this in um, Invisible Enemy as well. Is that after this point? It'll be a pleasure. Atlanta and Marina are the firmest of friends, and I think quite possibly that's probably the strongest friendship between two women that you see in the entire Jerry Anderson universe possibly only rivaled by Jane and Took later on which is a really nice um, a really nice way to to have this you know this love triangle dynamic of the two of them and Troy and yet you never get the feeling that they're in competition with each other. You never get the feeling that they don't care very deeply for each other. Um, and I, I just think it's lovely. They could have held up that, um, oh, she's a bit suspicious. I don't really like her. I don't really trust her throughout the whole series. And yet it's like, no, after this, Atlanta Marina, best buddies. Ah, Anyway, that was Plant of Doom, which I, I get the feeling I said more over that than I have done for, um, for quite a while. But there's a... There's rather a lot to say there because it, it's one of those episodes that feels rather like a, another big stepping stone forward to um, to bigger and better things. But in its own right is also um, a, a fairly impressive story and, um, and technical achievement anyway. I suppose it's rather an odd, odd choice for your second episode to go to here's a story about a killer plant. But um, yeah, it works pretty well. Um, Love the title though, Plant of Doom. It's not uh, it's not quite got the same sort of earth shattering um, you know, implications as Doctor Who titles that use the word doom, you know, seeds of doom. But Plant of Doom. That's pretty good. Yeah. One of the uh, one of the better stingrays, I think. Marina. Oh, off he goes. Aqua Marina. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. I did no, it is sweet, isn't it? But yeah. but but mm. Interestingly, Richard, uh, you've been going on about a blooming pot plant, and it yeah, was plants of doom. <laughs> I know. Let's hope no smoke starts pouring at that pot plant, or we're done for. <laughs> now, quite cruel at the end there that they uh, basically almost let Marina die, which is uh, a bit mean. Yes, so, I know. Uh, perhaps Simon Allen could uh, do us a recording of what Marina thought of those moments. Uh, oh, I thought you could say a, a recording of Marina in her death throes. No, no, not that. She didn't die. <laughs> it's fine. But, um, no, I mean, the, the uh, weird the smoking pot plant and, oh, yes, we can stop it smoking or kill the plant by throwing it on the floor. Uh, very odd. Yes. But kind of, it didn't matter. But I just remember watching that as a kid and thinking it was a very strange hey. thing. Mm. Mm. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, Stingray, as charming as ever. Yeah, always. So yeah. thank you, Chris. Lovely. And we haven't had it for a while, so lovely to have it back on the randomizer. Yes, that's true. Now, I don't know if you know this, Richard, but next week um, there'll be another randomizer. What? What, another randomizer? Yeah. It's almost like there's one every week. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's getting that way, isn't it? So oh. uh, if you want more randomizer, then do come back for pod 112 next week. Yes. Where there will also be part two of our chat with Brian Cox and Robin Ince. Mm-hmm. And a load of other stuff like some news and a fab fact, probably. I mean... Oh, I should say so. Isn't it amazing, all these things, on this Jerry Anderson-themed podcast? How do we do it? Well, no, why do we do it? <laughs> why do they listen? Uh, anyway, if you have been listening to all, to all the way to this point, thank you so much. We do love having you. I would really love it. If you would go and leave us a, a review or a rating, even as, as Richard yeah, has yeah. christened them. We ask regularly, and, uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of you think, oh, yeah, well, I don't want to do that. You know, mm. I'll listen. Isn't, isn't that enough? I put myself through listening. Um, <laughs> but it really does help. And we know that there are thousands of you who listen, but only hundreds of you who have reviewed. So yes, that makes yes, me rather true. sad. And that makes Marina very sad, doesn't it, Marina? You see? Yeah, there you are. She's so upset she could barely communicate how upset she is. So (laughs) please do us a favour. You just uh, tap on the the cover art of the podcast where you're the podcast player you're listening through, or scroll down for the review section. Just really quickly just write us a little review. Doesn't even have to be that nice to be honest, you know, just whatever you're feeling. Anything will do. If you're thinking this is a totally rubbish podcast, then you know, review Mm. accordingly. We'll only be a bit sad. But do think of Marina. Think of Marina. So, yes, exactly. thank you. I'm going to be keeping an eye on the reviews and revatings over the next couple of weeks to see if that has any effect whatsoever. Nice. And if it doesn't, then um, I shall be Wait. mildly upset. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> 
Anyway, no, thank you for listening to Podsterons. Please email us your thoughts, questions, etc. to podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. Tweet us, follow us, do some stuff, and join the Facebook group. Yeah. And once you've done all those things, it'll be time to listen all over again for Pod 112 it, next week. It'll soon be here. Uh, right, we should go. Thank you, Dickie. Thank you, listeners. Thank you, Chris. Goodbye. Bye. Stage one complete. Let's go. So do you think they'll um, leave any reviews? Of course they will. Oh, well, that's nice. Yeah, they're, they're a lovely bunch, aren't they, the Podsterons? They are a lovely bunch, so I, I have no doubt that we'll have some some rave uh, fact, reviews rolling in. Fact, in fact, I can, I can sense someone's leaving one right now. Oh. I can sense that they're just hovering over the star rating. It, it, oh, it's a four star. Well. Uh, oh, now they're going down to the text. Oh, I can sense the fingers are flickering over the keyboard. Here it comes. I really enjoy the Benji and Nick show. Oh. oh, Simon Allen leaving typical. that, isn't it? Yeah. It isn't that typical? Yeah. Oh. Okay, if well. What a job doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have to leave our own reviews now, goodness That's me. That's true. I could leave a review. I haven't done that. Oh, okay. Well, fine. You can do that now. I, and I, I might do the same. And <laughs> yeah, uh, right. that'll add us two more. Right. Okay. Uh, we better go do that. Good luck with your yeah. review. Thanks. And you. See you next week. Bye. You have been listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Wasn't it fun? You have been listening to an Anderson Entertainment production.